Welcome to our newest webinar. It's a beautiful summer day here in Michigan, and I'm so glad that you're joining us. And today we are going to be talking about, I think, one of the most both exciting but also complex areas of financial planning, which is how to retire earlier than a traditional retirement age. This is a topic that we work with a lot of people who are capable of retiring earlier than, you know, in your 50s or even 40s. And we also know, though, that there's not a common roadmap like there might be for people when they reach their mid-60s. And so it is often a conversation where people think they're in good shape, but they're not quite sure what retirement might look like or whether they're in good enough shape. And of course, you know, many people have a desire to retire earlier if they can. So we want to kind of give you a peek behind the curtain in terms of how to actually get that done. I think that this will be a useful presentation for everyone and even people who don't plan to retire earlier. But the topic today is how to retire com comfortably in your 50s. And I am Melissa Joy. I am founder at Pearl Planning and a financial planner. Not too much of me. Hopefully, let's get on to the topics at hand. We're going to be talking about making retirement real, early retirement truths, and kind of some practical knowledge when it comes to retirement, technical planning topics, and extra considerations that you may think of that don't have to do with the dollars and cents, and then how to supercharge your retirement readiness. Throughout this presentation, I would encourage you to put questions into our Q&A section. We would love to hear your questions and have it be interactive. And if we have time at the end, I'm also going to be showing you some information about actual kind of like how we are able to lay out a retirement for an early retiree by using our financial planning software. So without further ado, let's get into the learning phase of our conversation. And I first want to talk to you about, is it time to get serious about retirement? Because I think some of you just self-selected into this presentation uh, because you're like, I want to retire as soon as possible. I love people who come in and they already know the date they want to retire. One example I use is a client I worked with who said, on the day my youngest graduates from high school, that will be the day that I work the last day, and then I'll be retired after that. But actually, in some cases, retirement can kind of sneak up on you. And so that's why I think this topic is broader than just people who have kind of self-selected into the early retiree mode. So in some cases, people just find that they are no longer able to work or can't work. But for other people where it's applicable, you just really have this dream and you feel like you've accumulated enough or you have a current situation that makes retirement possible. And then some people actually experience, you know, kind of that golden egg. They either have a windfall, whether it comes comes to a beneficial financial circumstance, perhaps there's an inheritance or some other sudden wealth, or they've just been fantastic savers. And so they're kind of ahead of the average American and investors. And so, and so they have the right amounts. Sometimes it's within your control when you can retire, and sometimes it's outside of your control. And we can talk about that with a few statistics in just a moment. So one of the things that I tell people when it comes to retirement is your working years are often you experience cash flow like a river. It's never ending. It's a supply that just continues to replenish itself. And when you get into retirement, you have more of a situation where you cannot replenish. There's no do-overs. You can't go back to work and um, recreate the earning years that you tended to have in your peak accumulation years in your you know 30s through 60s. And so it's a really different mindset and people that can be very competent and skilled in terms of building their wealth can feel like it's a completely new territory, a completely different environment when it comes to actually withdrawing from your portfolio. So I use this river and stream analogy to say that's it feels different because it is. And fortunately, both information that we're going to provide provide in this presentation, as well as kind of modern financial planning portfolio theory has some answers to that new, you know, kind of feeling and perspective. I mentioned earlier that some people who retire are retiring because they plan to, and, you know, I don't want to over 
inundate you with too many um, kind of charts and graphs, but I think that this one is really inf- interesting. JP Morgan and Chase create a guide to the retirement that they refresh each year. And this is survey data from the Employee Benefit Research Institute that asks retirees who retired earlier than they had planned why they retired. And the first note is that more people expect to retire later than actually end up retiring later. Uh, 68% of current workers expect to work to age 65, and yet only 31% of workers of retirees end up working that long. And there are a variety of reasons why people may retire earlier. In gray are some of the reasons that respondents provide that could be out of your control, whether it's disability or health issue which includes 35% of early retirees, or if there's changes at a company or downsizing and it's difficult to find a new job or you choose not to, maybe you need to care for another family member. And so working becomes prohibitive with a schedule that is provided. We know we have clients that are in those circumstances or just your the work that you're expected to do kind of changes over time. But then in purple are some of the reasons that I think many people would consider to be beneficial. Maybe they could afford to because they have done the right savings. That's about a third of earlier retirees. Maybe you are changing your focus. You're ready to work on something new and you might have kind of a twilight career or do something that's a passion that doesn't pay you. Or in some cases, people get an early retirement package that can provide enough money for them to retire. So I just want to emphasize here that it's not just, you know, those who plan to retire that end up retiring earlier. And that's why I think that this topic is critical for a broader audience. So also there are some changes in spending patterns over retirement. And we like people to understand this as we start to discuss retirement because it goes into the science of kind of our technical financial planning. We call this the retirement spending smile. And what it means is that there for people are ten, there tend to be go-go years, slower go years, and then no-go years that might cost more because of healthcare and housing costs. This is a theory that was created by financial planners in the 80s and 90s. And then the actual data, if you look at this chart, this is banking data, again, from JP Morgan in their guide to retirement. They take aggregated data of people who have households of the $1 to $3 million range. And I'm using that number because typically the earliest retirees, those that retire in their 50s, tend to have gathered assets that are in these ranges typically. And so you can see that you tend to spend more money in your 50s than you do in your 60s, tend to spend more money in your 60s than you do in your 70s. And then people, again, stay closer to home and and have a little bit less consumption into their 80s. And then there's an uptick oftentimes due to healthcare costs, as well as if you need more extensive care, your housing may change at the end of life that kind of ticks things back back up. And so that is helpful because I think if you're working with someone who's helping you understand whether you can retire, you need to understand that it more naturally your consumption may you may want your consumption to be higher in earlier years. We often will build in expenses in the earlier retirement years such as vacations, more frequent car replacements, um, remodeling, etc. Um, It's surprising to people sometimes that your last big ticket item is not going to come before you retire. It would be difficult. Or actually, we just would prefer that people not feel like they can't do new things after they retire that are bigger. And so that's where a financial planner can kind of build things in. So let's talk about some techniques for early retirement. Some information, I guess if said if I say this section in a different way, information you need to be aware of, information you need to know. One of the pieces of information that I think everybody would love if when they go to a financial planner, there's just a crystal ball that says, hey, $2.1 million is the right amount that you need for retirement or $1.2 million, just a finite number. And unfortunately, it does not work that way. We, every person is different. There's not one single number for people. People have wildly different lifestyles based on where they live, what they like to do, who they are, what they value, the experiences that they enjoy, the things that they need to maintain, the expectations of their family, et cetera. 
And so one of the jobs of a financial planner and one of the differences between going on your online 401k calculator and saying, hey, how much could I spend if I retire, which often just says, oh, you could do a paycheck of $5,000 a month out of this bucket of money. It's more nuanced than that when it comes to actual retirement planning. First of all, important considerations are what are your needs and what are your wants. And sometimes there's a line blurred between needs and wants. I think that wants are often needs when it comes to kind of personal satisfaction, purpose, et cetera. But you would go through and you would talk about all of the expenses that you have, for example, that are durable. They're they're not going to change during retirement. So that's, you know, you're going to continue to pay the taxes on your home. You're going to pay your mortgage if you haven't paid your mortgage off. You don't have to have no debt in order to retire, just FYI. You are going to be purchasing health insurance if you're retiring before age 65 and you'll need to to know what those costs are and, and have a plan for how to spend money. You are also going to be paying taxes, maybe in a different way. It may be at a lower rate. We love to hear that, but you need to plan for those expenses as well. You're still gonna be going to the grocery store. Hopefully you'll be traveling if that's something you love to do. We need to build in all of those expectations in terms of costs. We also need to understand where income will be coming from during retirement. And this is not something that is always a static or finite amount. So oftentimes, you know, Social Security will kick in at a certain age. Some people like to plan for age 70. Other people like to plan for earlier. We would have conversations with people when it comes to your Social Security age and talk through the impact of Social Security. There's a bigger kind of bang for your buck when you delay Social Security for those who are less reliant on their investment portfolio. And so we can talk through some of the nuances on that. Some people have residual pensions or perhaps they were public workers like teachers, government employees, which have a much bigger percentage of pensions nowadays than used to. But if you have a pension, when would that pension turn on and what amount of money would you be receiving? Most people live off of a portion of their investments as well. And I would assume that most people on this webinar would be included in that And then some people may go into a transitional phase where they do some part-time work that either fulfills a purpose, keeps them busy, et cetera. And we can also pencil in some of those dollars, or perhaps you're able to continue consulting when you've previously been doing a job that was a W-2 income, and perhaps you could be self-employed. We would talk about all the factors that you can control things that you can do to prep for retirement and also good behavior during retirement. Where are you going to be taking money? You, for many of the early retirees, are going to have some optionality about, do I take it from this account, from my cash account, from my investment account, from my IRA or 401k? So those would be things of where you take money, where you can control, how much you spend is something you can control. But there's also things that are just not expected. The tax rates will likely change during your retirement phases. There will be bear markets. You can't just assume that you go into a phase where you were lucky enough to have 30, 40, 50 years of retirement without down markets. There will be different unexpected changes, probably personally, and we can't accommodate knowing all of those in advance. What we can do is have a game plan that has built-in safety of flexibility and resilience so that you can both be planning for what you expect as well as for the unexpected. And that and that's, you know, really the value of a financial planner is building in a plan that has room for the unexpected and room for change. Okay. So one of the big questions for people, if we're talking about retiring in your 50s, is where can I take money before I turn age 59 and a half? Because it turns out that for most retirement plans, there is a 10% penalty if you are to access funds prior to to age 59 and a half. I'm speaking specifically about 401ks, 403bs, 457s have a little bit earlier availability. Your IRAs have that rule. But there's a lot of ways to work around that. And we find our early retirees are also super savers. So, you know, they often have these pools or buckets of money. For some people, you may build up big emergency reserves, big cash, and that can fund some of those earliest years of retirement. Also, a very popular method that we really like is taxable and saving in taxable investment accounts. So your brokerage accounts, accounts that are titled in your name, your trust name, or joint. These accounts don't have as many tax breaks prior to retirement, but they're 
pretty tax, they become a more tax advantaged portfolio during retirement because you tend to have to not pay on everything you take out. You only pay on the money you made. And oftentimes that money is taxed at a capital gains rate of 15 or 20%, depending on your income. And there's even a portion of income that could be at the 0% bracket if you don't have a lot of other income in earlier years of retirement. So we really like taxable investments for those who plan to retire earlier. And even if you are sitting here listening to this webinar and you're 50 or 51 and you're like, well, I don't have that type of account yet, doing some saving in an account like that or like for the next few years can be really advantageous to giving you a bridge to over to age 59 and a half. There are some ways to get money out of an IRA or 401k before or 403b before um, age 59 and a half. One of them is the 72T method where you can do substantially equal payments over a period of years. If you submit things in the right way, then you can do those payments and bridge the gap to age 59 and a half. They typically have a minimum of five years and there's some more complex kind of calculations and considerations for that, but that is one way you can avoid a 10% penalty on early distributions. Also, if you are in a company retirement plan and you retire from your last job at age 55, that plan can be eligible for taking money out before age 59 and a half without the penalty. It's after age 55, though, so that's a really important number. There's also more flexibility in Roth IRA accounts. You can tend to take money out from the principal that you put in. You can also, after a five-year period, take money out from the growth without penalty. There are some limitations when it comes to both age as well as how recently you converted the funds that tend to try to eliminate people from just automatically converting and then taking the money right away. But the Roth IRAs are more flexible than traditional IRAs or 401ks. Same with Roth 401ks. And then other income, whether it's a pension, if you're a public employee or you have access to a pension, social security, if you had a disability situation or disability income, um, if you were one of those who had planned to work longer but had a disability circumstance or other work. So all of these kind of factor in. It may be that you're making some money, it's just not as much in terms of regular income. Um, another thing that I left out is you. there could be a situation where some of the income was annuitized as well, although there are cer- certain limitations on when you take those funds out as well. Okay, so there's a lot of strategies that are options. But what other considerations do you need to be aware of? Well, most retirees enjoy the privileges of Medicare and health insurance before age 65 can be a challenge because it's expensive, especially if you have a minor child or a dependent child who's also included on the insurance. It's interesting though, I have some earlier retirees who have more than a million dollars saved and invested, and they are eligible for Affordable Care Act subsidies based on the income they're reporting on their taxes. So there are some ways to reduce the cost of health insurance. We just like to connect people with insurance agents that are reputable for health insurance that can understand what you value in terms of your insurance and what's important to you, what carriers are important to you as well so that they can help you get connected with the right insurance. And the right answer may be that you stay on COBRA for a few years if you're eligible for that and then switch. But one of our jobs would be to get a realistic assessment of what your insurance would cost as well as your out-of-pocket costs might be, and then go and make sure that that's included in the earlier retirement years. So you're not surprised when you've already you know, had your retirement party and then you're like, oh my gosh, I cannot afford $2,500 a month for an insurance premium. It depends. Also big ticket items, I think I mentioned earlier, people kind of assume, or I've heard some people that are like, I'm going to do the last house project before we retire. It's all going to be funded. And then for the next 30 years, we're not going to have any big expenses. And that's just unfortunately or fortunately not realistic. There are bigger ticket items. You probably haven't purchased your last vehicle. You're not going to be driving a 30-year car, 30-year-old car 25 years from now. And so probably haven't done your last home improvement project, whether that's out of necessity because something breaks or out of a desire to, you know, perhaps make your home a little bit easier to live in as you age, you may have family needs over time. So you need to build in both. You can, we can do some realistic assessments of other costs in our initial planning, and you need to leave some cushions so that you don't just have 
only room for certain spending. Another consideration is taxes over time can be radically different. If you were an early retiree and you'd saved a lot in cash and taxable investment accounts, your taxes may be extraordinarily low in early years. And then you may be building and building your retirement accounts. And if you spend all of your taxable and cash accounts first, those retirement accounts that you go to after age 59 and a half might have a really big tax bill. And so we like to smooth out taxes over time. This is, again, I'd say a little bit higher degree of difficulty planning and consideration than just kind of a fix it and forget it. You know, I'd like to take out 4% out of every single account is what sometimes I, I have clients that like to do. It is a higher degree of difficulty because there may be certain years where some accounts are more preferable to take out of. And if you have a really great um, circumstance and a variety of accounts to choose from, you can also sometimes be repositioning assets in these low tax years so that they are going to be not costing you as much over time. So one primary example is to take money from retirement accounts when you're eligible at a lower tax bracket, fill up a 10 or 12% tax bucket. If I'm going over your head, I can explain it further in a one-on-one -on -one conversation or doing Roth conversions for small portions of your retirement plans so that when you get to the years that you're required or have to take money out of those accounts, you don't have as much of an expense. So there can be both. You need to understand what your taxes will be because your paycheck isn't going to be just automatically withholding. You may need to do some estimates, but there may be some ways you can control for taxes so that more money is able to be spent by you primarily, left for your heirs secondarily, and less money is, is there for Uncle Sam. And then how do you rec recreate your paycheck? This is, I've left this for last, but this is like the number one thing that people want to ask. Like, okay, Melissa, you told me I can retire. You told me my numbers look good, but like, how does that check actually go into my account? What account am I taking from? How much can it be? When will I receive it? And there's a lot of flexibility in this. Some people just like, you know, I want a chunk of cash at the beginning of the year that I can spend throughout the year and it feels better to me. A lot of people, I tell them, hey, let's recreate the paycheck you're receiving. You, University of Michigan employees receive a paycheck once a month. And so I say, hey, can we receive the same paycheck once a month? I have a client who's been receiving a significant amount of spousal support for the last 10 years, and they are going to, their spousal support is going to be ending. So that is, you know, kind of a new phase, a new retirement phase for that person. And their numbers are really good. Um, and when they were like, well, tell me exactly how much money I'm going to get. And they have um, the ability to spend even more than that spousal support check, but they really haven't been spending much more than that. I started with, let's send you the exact same amount that we you're getting in your spousal support check starting the month after it ends. And so that's a great way for them to work it out. Ten, we tend to, for early retirees, have a couple times of the year that are really important to plan. The first time of the year would be as you're getting ready to retire, you're making that game plan from for the next year or two. And then you're refining it because you're reviewing to see if there's any tax circumstances that may give you more room to save on taxes or fill up a very low tax bracket. So we really like to review things in the fourth quarter and then set things up to change in the first quarter. And sometimes there's some action that needs to be done before the end of the calendar year. And this is where you can really get value when it comes to working with a financial planner, especially in early retirement, is they just are thinking about things if doing it the right way that just may not be as high on your radar or you've read an article about it, but you're just not sure how it applies to you and you don't feel like you have the tools and calculators in order to make effective decisions. And that's the a good financial planner can help narrow down the decisions into the right ones um, to help you kind of get through and make decisions over time. I often like to remind people when it comes to retirement, if you look at the red line on the bottom, people tend to start with their money and be like, well, how does that you know, kind of, how does these accounts fund my retirement? I really want you to be thinking about your purpose how you're spending money, what's important to you in retirement, some qualitative conversations, not just the quantitative of how many dollars and cents can I get. Start there. 
build the plan based on your needs and then position the portfolio, build the portfolio to meet your needs in your plan. So just a reminder of how, you know, I think another said another way, the the left-hand target can be seen as the person. The person is where you should start. The person, the family unit, whoever is going to be impacted by this plan and then go through the plan and portfolio. I often try to dissuade people from a, a common assumption that we inherited from our grandparents and parents, which is that you should never touch the principal of your portfolio in retirement, and instead you should live off of the interest. And that tends to send people either toward bonds or because interest rates have been so low recently, it sends people toward, I think I want dividend paying stocks as the primary thing that I own in my investment account over time, because then it will be easy for me to clip a coupon and receive a paycheck out of your portfolio. This chart shows you, it's just using the Vanguard Total Market Bond Index and Vanguard 500 Index in its total return and and showing you the dividend yield over time of these two broadly used examples of bonds and stocks. And what you'll notice is that these charts do not stay flat. So it would be beautiful if every year you got 4% from bonds or 4% from the dividends of stocks, but that just is not the case. Over time, stock dividends have gone up and down. This is looking back to the year 2000. The same goes for bonds. We've had historically low interest rates. And if somebody retired in 2006 or 2007 and they had interest rates that were close to 6%, 5.5%. And then they had that just like, I'll just live off of the interest strategy. They would be feeling very, you know, dividend poor and income poor over the last 15 years. And we want to avoid that. So we tend to recommend a withdrawal strategy that looks at all a variety of investments, a portion of your investments in bonds, a portion of your investments in stocks based on your risk considerations and your needs, and then withdraw from whichever area is doing the best and reduce the withdrawals from the areas that aren't doing as well so that you're rebalancing as you withdraw. And then the just as important as setting up that portfolio is which account should you use. So we actually start with based on tax considerations, here's the accounts we should use. And then we talk about how do you invest within that account, but you don't need to replicate a paycheck per se. Because if you looked at the same chart, especially on the purple and stocks over time for how did that portfolio do, even though the dividends were going down, 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 the returns of the S&P over the same time period, even in a lost decade between 2000 and 2010 through 2024 are much better. So that is, you know, that is, we want you to get kind of a total return perspective versus narrowing your focus to the income of the portfolio, because that just can send you down the wrong pathway when it comes to retirement success. Okay. What are some considerations? I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because I feel like it's really just, it needs to be its own separate space and time. We've done podcast episodes on this and past webinars, but there are considerations beyond the dollar when it comes to retirement. And using this push methodology of making sure you have a purpose, having an understanding of how you're going to use your time, making sure you're socializing effectively in retirement that keeps you healthy, and maintaining behaviors that foster a sense of well-being and health, just actual physical, mental, emotional health as well are really important for retirement. So I think some people tend to focus so much on the numbers and then they find themselves themselves lost when it comes to retirement in terms of their purpose. And you may not be able to fix that all at once, but I think anticipating it, understanding that for some people who really derive a lot of their sense of well-being and identity from the work that they do and yet still want or need to retire, that you're gonna need to do some work on your sense of self and identity. Now, that's not everybody. Some people are living their best lives on day one of retirement and they feel the same on in year five and year 10. But I just want you to be aware that you need to understand if you're somebody that thrives on structured time that you need to be, you may need to be seeking to rebuild some of the structures that helped you stay healthy and happy pre-retirement. 
I just talked to a friend who's experiencing this, who really had so much purpose in their work, really wanted to retire and it was important to them, but there's, they are uh, just experiencing rougher transition than some other people may experience in those early years of retirement. And that is, they are not alone, even though it can feel like a really lonely feeling. And so spending time thinking about that purpose, being really intentional about knowing that it may feel different and it may not all feel perfect is something that I I like to remind people to do. Okay, let's talk about techniques. If you're sitting here and you're saying, I am in, I'm sold, I know I need a purpose, but I've got that purpose and I am so excited to retire. And I should mention, you know, this is often, there are different retirement dates for one partner versus another in a family unit if there's more than one of you who are working. But here's how we like to see people supercharging their retirement. First off, many of you who are thinking about retiring have been super savers. And so you've been, you know, kind of pre-defining that purpose. And you're just really coming to me to be like, I think here's everything I've saved, uh, Melissa. Just tell me how to write that paycheck because I think it's enough. Prove to me it's enough to, you know, like trust but verify. But how do I how do I do it? So they have a lot of these buckets. Just as a like rule of thumb for advisor, if you've been living off of more than, if you have income of more than 150 or 200,000 a year, and you've only been maxing out like one 401k, for example, or less than that, um, you're less of a candidate for this early retirement. So adding some of these additional buckets can really help you catch up, but you can do some of that catch up really quickly. But many people we come to who come to us have already been, you know, kind of knowing that they wanted to save a little bit more. So they're coming with some of these buckets. We already mentioned, we love for early retirees taxable investments because there's no restrictions on when you can spend that money. And it, it's very flexible and it becomes a much more tax advantageous asset in distribution phase when you are creating those retirement paychecks. HSA, I should have written out the full words, but the health savings account is something that can be just like kind of like a cafeteria plan if you're in a high deductible health plan and you have an HSA where you just like the money goes in and the money goes out in the same year. But we love to turn the health savings account into an investment account that can help you to pay for out-of-pocket um, expenses, pharmaceutical costs, et cetera, in early retirement and help offset some of those bigger insurance costs that you will see when you, if you're not you know, getting subsidized insurance from your employer anymore. Roth IRAs are great too, because we told you both they have a tax advantage. Um, you you paid the taxes in the beginning, so you get the tax advantage at the end. They also don't have as, they aren't as restrictive for you to make withdrawals. Having cash on hand and emergency reserves is always good. And so if you're able to have that money, then we'll talk you, to you about what is the right amount and how do we replenish that. We don't say that you have to have every piece of debt paid off, but having lower debt is definitely better. And if you're someone who spends wisely, not spends every last cent that's left, I mean, that you know filters back to the emergency reserves, it fil- filters back to the taxable investments, but just having control and understanding how you spend money can be very helpful. If you're an investor who sticks with your strategy, the first time you have a bear market during your early retirement, it may feel different. It probably will because you're like, well, this is the money I have to have to spend. But if you have a pattern of staying invested and not kind of deviating based on what the market is doing, that is a really good way to be ready for retirement because you're going to need some of that discipline over the years during retirement. And then just someone who's looking at opportunities and advantages and um, refreshing their financial planning, picking up dollars and cents along the way based on their financial decisions that are proactive and engaged, those are prime candidates for early retirement as well. I always tell people, do one thing today to make, that's going to make tomorrow easier. So you don't need to go back to this list of all of these accounts and say, oh, sorry, we're not, we're going to take half of our paycheck and just, you know, knock all of these things out. What I would instead encourage encourage you to do is pick one and focus on that and then layer and add another over time. 
Okay, so I've gotten to the end of my um, kind of presentation mode. I want to encourage everyone that we do have a Q&A in the bottom, or you can also place questions in chat. So please feel free to add in any questions. But I thought I could show you in our retirement planning software, like what an early retiree may look like in terms of how they spend their money. I'll try to keep my eye on those that Q&A but let me share my screen here. Okay, so let's say that we've got this family. They were really good savers. They are, Sarah and Steve are ages 54 and 52. They've also got an 18-year-old that they're gonna be paying for college for. And they come to us and they say, uh, we would like to retire at age 58 and 57. They're actually two different years, that's okay. They're making good money. They are, they're earning about 400,000 a year. And they also have given us, well, we're going to estimate their social security in this case, but, and they're also doing some saving. They're maxing the two 401ks um, and they, over the years have saved some in taxable accounts. So they've got about 75,000 in the bank. They've got, they pay their credit cards off each month, but they're spending money on their credit cards. That's okay. They've got their two 401ks that they're putting a lot of money in, and then they've got a taxable investment account that has about 600000 in it. Um, maybe it was from company stock they got over the years, or there just were some years that they had more money to save. And they still do have a mortgage on their house that the home is 750000 but they bought that house, they expanded and bought the dream home in 2020. And so they've got 30 more years. Oh, fortunately for them, they were in the lower interest rate environment than if they bought the house today. Okay, so that's their story. They also do have She's working at Ford and have uh, some Ford equity compensation. They have 20,000 shares granted. Um, that's a nice grant that they'll be receiving over the next few years. So when it comes to retirement, we would be looking and saying, we give them percentages. I'll go over that you know, if we talk one-on-one. -on -one. But we would actually be looking, and here's their desire to retire at age 58 for her, 57 for him. And we have that 400,000 of income that we inflate. And then this is the year that just he works. And then down here, Social Security starts at age 70. And then the second Social Security comes on at age her age 72, his age 70. And we need to fill in the gap of all these years. First, we need to determine based on those percentages, are they going to have enough to live? And then the second thing that we need to do is like, where is that money going to come from? And so we look at these years and see if it's sustainable for them to, in this case, pull out quite a bit of money. And we're going to actually show them, for example, what if we do a paycheck out of your um, your retirement account. I'm gonna, let me just add that in to show you how that would work. I'm gonna add in some income from a withdrawal from your, a distribution from your taxable account. Of $100,000 a year. And we're gonna take that out of the taxable that they've saved. And we're gonna start that at, um, his retirement because they're kind of funded and then end after four years. And let's give them an inflation adjustment each year. And that's going to be normal. And then I think I'll be able to show them hey, we've got this game plan for here's where the money's going to come out. There's a little more that you may need, and we may decide to use that at age 59 and a half from the 401k, but we just may look and see. Um, but we can go in and actually like give them the specific place that the money's going to come out. Here's your taxable distribution. Would you like that to be an $8,500 a month paycheck, or do you want $50,000 in January and July? Things like that. So that's how we kind of string together a look. And we're also going to recommend to them, hey, what if we save, turn your HSA into an investment account? What if we save a little more in taxable? The proceeds of these, this RSUs, the equity compensation that you receive in future years, what if we do this or that? So that's kind of how it looks like. I know I'm going really fast, but 
if you can see that's different than just a calculator where you, you know, kind of aren't quite sure where the money's coming from and things like that, it can be much more, you know, nuanced and detailed if we do things that way. So I just wanted you to be familiar that we're going to get really into specifics when it comes to retirement. And then even I will use a table for those first retirement years of here's where the money's going to come from. Here's where we're going to, we're going to check in in October. We're going to talk to your CPA. And in some years we may do a Roth conversion. In this particular case, let me just visualize for you. They have these early retirement years where they go into the 0% tax bracket, and there actually may be room for them to draw from, withdraw from their accounts or do a Roth conversion. And I just mocked up here some conversions in those years. So if they took 190,000 out of their taxable account, but then converted 30, 35, 38, like small amounts out of their their accounts before they have to start withdrawing from the 401k, then they would be able to save more. I don't, I wouldn't use these projections and numbers as, you know, they are a crystal ball, but I I think it is reasonable to say they would be able to save more. Of course, in these forward-looking projections, there's assumptions about investment returns and things like that, but we do kind of create a more variable investment environment, which we go over with you when we talk about things like this. Let me change my screen back to our presentation because I don't, you guys are such good listeners, but I don't see any questions. So feel free to raise your hand if you have any final questions. And let me just, sorry, um, stop my share and get the right screen up so I can wrap things up. So I know many of you are friends of the firm and thank you so much for listening. If you have specific follow-ups that you want to email me to me, please don't hesitate to email. This presentation will also be in a video form on our YouTube page within the week. And so we'll be happy to send you copies and or if you have clients or clients, if you have, you know, a partner that has questions, please don't hesitate to send them the video or just, you know, forward it to us. It'll also be in our next newsletter. And then the in July and every quarter, we have an economic and investment update. We'll be focusing on what we see from tax projections based on the election, what we see in the markets right now. I think many people are surprised that markets are doing so well this year. That's We never know that we, we can never predict how markets gonna, are going to do, and we're just positioned to take to be, to be recipients of the market's goodwill. But we'll talk more about that in July. Additionally, listen to our Women's Money Wisdom podcast would be my other plug. And for the gentlemen in the room, it's it's a it's a light touch of the female side, but encourage anyone to listen in. And then, of course, you know where to find us. Most importantly, feel free to follow up with an email at melissa at pearlplan.com if you have any questions. And I always make sure to include our legal disclosures so that our compliance department is happy. Let me make sure there weren't any other questions. Great info. Thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it. Um, And have a great day.